This is the tank museum's Panzer III, this particular Aus room or execution or model we might call it, uh, is an L model. Um, so quite far into the production line. The Panzer III is that classic German tank of the early years of World War II. It's a tank we often see in the images that we associate with what we now know as Blitzkrieg. Um, but it actually had a very troubled birth. Don't forget that after the First World War, Germany, because of the Versailles Peace Treaty, is allowed no tanks at all. It's limited to an army of 100,000 men. Uh, not even an armoured car is allowed. But behind the scenes, the German army very quickly starts experimenting, looking at producing its own tank in the future and how it's going to try and protect itself against tanks. So very early on, they come up with the 37 millimeter anti-tank gun that they put on a small wheel chassis that can be horse-drawn. And later, that gun is actually used on the first models of the Panzer III. Germany in the 30s, uh, we go on to see the development of the tank, but in the 20s, they're trying to work out how to actually build tanks and what engineering skills and how they might even use those tanks. Now, at the end of the First World War, Germany sells a number of LK1 and then LK2, almost tank kits, to Sweden. After the First World War, they send some of the engineers to Sweden to practice the art of putting tanks together, the engineering that's required behind it, and getting people like Hans Vollmer, who helped develop the A7V in the First World War, a German engineer, he learns his trade further in Sweden. They also tie up with the Russians, something we forget with the Treaty of Rapello in 1922. Germany and Russia, and Soviet Russia this now is, they're the priors of Europe. Um, they get together and there's a secret clause in that treaty saying they're going to cooperate about in military matters. And in 1929 at Kazan out in Russia, uh, a base is developed where German officers, not in their own uniforms, go out and actually train and look at some of the issues to do with tank warfare. And they send out there some of their early models, their test model vehicles to trial. Now, Germany as well is, as an industrial base, they have problems. They don't have a massive motor car industry. So when the German army are thinking about how we're going to develop this new weapon that we want to be able to use, we've been at the receiving end in the First World War, they're looking around for the best industrial concerns that have skills and perhaps techniques to take these forward. And they start off in the 20s by going to Krupp, Rheinmetall and Daimler and getting them to build something that was called a gross tractor, a large tractor. A couple of years later, they do a light tractor. And these companies get a skill set together about how an armoured vehicle might be built. What are some of the main concerns? What are those issues? Things like transmission, tracks, armour plating. In the 20s, the Germans actually work out an effective method of welding armour plate which again is, is a brilliant idea because if you rivet armor plate, you need a framework to rivet that armor plate to. By welding it, not only are you actually making the armor watertight so you can deep wade, um, but you're saving, they worked out about four tons on an average side armored vehicle um, just by not having the framework and the rivets, which of course there's another problem with rivets, if they're hit by oncoming fire, they can actually shear off and become a projectile inside the tank as well. So all this is being experimented with. It's only in the early 1930s when Hitler comes to power that actually they take some of these earlier experiments and in 34, Hitler puts out an order to those same three companies to come up with the Panzer III and what was going to become the Panzer IV. Now the difference between those two tanks is the German army realized it wanted the Panzer III as its breakthrough weapon, the weapon that they will then exploit and continue through a gap if you've broken through a front line. And they wanted it, unlike some of the other European countries, to have a gun that would knock out other tanks. They did foresee Panzer III's bumping into enemy tanks and therefore needing to engage them. The Panzer IV was really a support vehicle for this Panzer III. 
it was going to have a short barreled 75mm gun that can fire high explosives so it can take on prepared positions. But it really was supporting this vehicle, not as in the Western countries, we tended to think of them as infantry support, vehicles that were going to help the infantry onto a target. So they're designed by the three companies. Daimler wins the competition that's put together um, for the Panzer III. The Panzer IV, interestingly, they end up looking very, very similar. Much argument afterwards about why did they bother creating two designs, which in the end had very, very similar features. Was it worth it? And this shows, in one sense, the influence of actually the German high command. They are quite happy to actually step in at certain times in tank production and say, we want you to go down this route. Panzer III, um, it has many teething troubles in its development. The first four models are um, really just to get the suspension system right. They want it, the German army wants it to have a 50 millimeter gun, but the 50 millimeter gun is not actually developed yet. So it starts off having the, Germ the standard German anti-tank gun, the 37 millimeter gun. Um, so early models, really trial affairs uh, to get the technique right. And uh, another issue we have to remember as well is Hitler is putting most of his resources into the Luftwaffe and to the Kriegsmarine, the Navy. Tanks are only a very small part between, of their overall budget, between 37 and 41, only 4.7% of German money on arms manufacture goes into tanks. The German war plan of 1935 is putting together about 69 divisions of infantry, three of cavalry and only three of tanks. So we mustn't fall into that trap of later German propaganda. When Hitler sees the success of the tank in 1940, he constantly bigs up, the propaganda bigs up the use of the tank all the time. Actually, before the Second World War, it's only a part of how the Germans, a small part of how the Germans think they're going to be facing up to future conflict. Now, the production of Panzer III is very, very slow. It doesn't come out at the rate, certainly, that Hitler wants. Um, and by the beginning uh, of the Polish campaign in September of 1939, there's barely 180 of these tanks are actually ready. So the early part of the war, Germany is really using it's training tanks, the Panzer I's and the Panzer II's, what Panzer III's and Panzer IV's are available, but being backed up enormously by captured Czech tanks. So the 35, 38T, tanks like that, they're the tanks that actually really help bolster the German forces of that period. The German military and the production side think they're going to be ready for a major war in about 1943. Hitler, as we know, he influences German tank design in the summer of 1940, when he sees the reports about the poor performance of the 37 millimeter gun on the early Panzer III's, he insists the long barreled 50 millimeter gun is fitted. In actual fact, it's 18 months before that gun actually gets on a Panzer III, and that makes him furious. Because if the long barreled 50 millimeter gun, which has a much better armor penetration capability, had been on the tank earlier, it probably wouldn't have suffered so much when it bumps into tanks in July of 1941, tanks like the KV-1 and the T-34. So Hitler, again, he's influencing tank design. He's looking at where he thinks design is going in the future. And don't forget, it's only after those summer victories that really Hitler then starts turning around and saying, this is what helped us win in the summer of May, in the summer of 1940 against France. It's the tank that then he concentrates some of his propaganda on and then he takes credit for some German Panzer generals using these Panzer III's to great effect. Now this particular model, it's an L model. Um, this one comes later in the production run. They stop making Panzer III's as gun tanks in August of 1943. It's earlier design, it's about mobility, it's for the attack. And that mobility means they keep the armour protection levels down. It's about 30 millimetres of armour plate on the front. Hitler again in the summer of 1940, when he sees again these bigger guns being used, he starts investigating up armoring his tanks. And some of that comes later as Schutzen, which are side plates, add on armor that are placed there. And uh, also in here, we've got what they called Vorpanzer, an extra 20 millimeter frontal plate put across um, 
just in front of the driver's and the bow machine gunner's position, that's up armoring the vehicle. But there was a point that Panzer III wasn't going to go beyond. They put um, the HL, um, the Maybach HL 120 engine in the back, later a, a Maybach TRM engine to try and up the horsepower, up the power. But really, this was a tank that when Germany gets to being on the defensive, you can't carry on adding too much armor protection. And the turret size, they start with that 37 millimeter gun, they then go on to a short barreled 50 millimeter, then the long barreled, as we can see here, 50 millimeter gun, the standard is a five centimeter anti-tank pack gun. And the very last model, the model Ausrung N, actually goes back to having the short barreled 75 millimeter gun that was going on the Panzer IV. But the Panzer III can't be developed any further. So they stop making it as a gun tank, they carry on making it because it's actually got lots of other very useful roles. So they carry on making it as a chassis for the famous Sturmgeschutz. And we'll look at Sturmgeschutz in another little film. So this particular model that shipped out to Benghazi uh, in North Africa, um, it's noted as being there, it's then issued to the uh, frontline troops. It, we think it's captured at the Battle of Alam Halfa, which is Rommel's last attempt, attempt to push through the British lines to get at Egypt. And um, it's captured in relatively good order. We've got photographs of it being debombed out there in, uh, in North Africa before it was sent back to Britain for analysis with a number of other captured German tanks. So we've got all the reports. And some of those reports in the British side of things, they pick out things they liked about this tank, such as its roomy turret with the commander at the back right in the middle. So he'd got good visibility going, looking forward. And he'd also got line of sight to his uh, gunner and his loader and almost through to the front of the vehicle where you've got the driver and the bow machine gun and radio operator. So that was picked up as being very good. They liked, they thought some of the technical details, even then they were picking up, that they seemed to be a bit over-engineered for what they were doing. Um, but one thing interesting, they did see a worry, was the welds. And even though the Germans had come up with this way of welding armor plate, those welds made the tank fairly vulnerable at certain times. If the welds weren't up to scratch, that was where the tank, if it was hit, would tend to split. And certainly if you look at images of internal explosions, that's where, again, um, quite often you'll see that the, uh, the cracks are going along the seam lines of the welds. Um, other issues they looked at, this is torsion bar suspension. The early models, different companies, Daimler went for torsion bar, Krupp when they were putting their proposal together because Krupp had a railway background, they were actually looking at uh, using double bogies on the vehicle. So you've got what they call trailing arms as torsion bar suspension, a shock absorber at the front. One of those simple little problems though with the complexity of some of these vehicles, the German troops found it actually hard to get the liquid that was due to go in the shop absorbers um, out to the front line all the time. Dry sprocket at the front, engine at the rear, um, advantages and disadvantages of having the drive at the back. This debate goes on very often, but um, the advantage you can see here is there's a long track run going all the way before it reaches the drive sprocket, and that means things like mud and sand are shaken off so that by the time it gets to the drive sprocket, you should have less wear and tear on that front drive sprocket. I've mentioned the armor plate, 30 millimeter at front as standard, an extra 20 millimeter added here. And they were also, they've put a framework over the front mantlet of this L. They were gonna add more extra armor plate over that as well. This particular version didn't have that extra armor added. Uh, and again, later in the war, you'll see Schutzen, we mentioned, side plate. They were first put on to help try and tumble solid shot. If it hit the Schutzens away from the vehicle, it may not have the full impact when it hit the face hardened armor plate on the front or on the sides where it's even thinner. Um, they also found, of course, later with hollow charge weapons, if it detonates it away from the main body of the vehicle, you've got an off what they call standoff distance to dissipate the effect of hollow charge weapons such as a bazooka or a piat round. Um, so they were added as well. Armed with uh, MG-34s in the front and as a coaxial, and as on this vehicle you can see we one for anti-aircraft defense as well. Um, it was a very good, relatively reliable tank. It had so many teething troubles like tanks before it, and uh, no tank is reliable in the way perhaps comparing it to a modern car. They break down all the time. It has a good power to weight ratio. It had good mobility early on, but 
By 1943, the Germans have realized themselves this is now an outclass vehicle. So it's, it's converted into other roles. Some are made into munitions carriers. Some are made into uh, recovery vehicles. They'd already got a flamethrower version, a command version, an artillery observation version, but the most of them end up carrying on being produced as Sturmgeschützes, where they were very, very effective. Um, Cost-wise, you could build three Sturmgeschützes for two of these Panzer IIs, so there's a lot more technicalities going into this one. So a classic vehicle of the early war German victories, but also an interesting vehicle because it helps us understand perhaps a little bit more about how the Germans got to that, um, the tank in, on the battlefield position and how they were going to use or how they thought they were going to use that tank. And again, let's not forget the German propaganda that bigs up that sense of the use of the tank only after those victories um, in May of 1940 in France, Belgium, Holland.